Okay, hello and welcome to all that have joined us today. We're now going to begin the webinar on the OWASP API Security Top 10. My name is Kristen Davis and I'm the head of marketing over here at 42 Crunch. I do not participate in the OWASP API Top 10, but I made some cool graphics for you guys today. And my colleague here joining me today is Dmitry Sotnikov. Vice President of Cloud Platform here at 42 Crunch, and he is also a contributor to the OWASP API Top 10. Just a few things before we start. Everyone's going to be muted for the duration of this presentation to avoid disruption. And this webinar is going to be recorded, so don't worry if you have to leave early or anything. You guys will get a follow up email with a link to the webinar as well as the OWASP cheat sheet. Questions are encouraged. You can ask at any time during the webinar, but we will take all the questions and answer those at the end. But feel free to shoot us questions as we're going through the slides. And we'll do a follow up blog with all the questions and answers so that you have them in one place. And we'll send that out in the follow up email as well. Last but not least, you guys, when you exit the webinar, a survey is going to pop up. It is super quick, it's multiple choice, and I would really appreciate the feedback. Our whole team would, if not for yourself, do it for marketing, do it for little old Kristen D over here. It would make my day. And now for the featured presentation, I'm gonna pass this over to Dimitri. All right, looks like I'm, like I'm unmuted now. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, this presentation is not going to be about any commercial tooling or any really any any technology. So we'll we'll talk about the OWASP API top 10. And then for each of the top 10, I will just give an example um, of what it looks like in the in the wildlife and I'll touch quickly on uh, what you could do to, to mitigate them. And again, as Christian mentioned, I'm just one of the contributors to OWASP API top 10. It's a community effort. Um, I'm not a lead of it. Uh, this project is, is led by uh, uh, Eris Yalon, Yannon Skeddy, and uh, coordinated by Paolo Silva. And it's really a, a community effort with more than a dozen people contributing to it. Anyway, so why API security? So I, I have just quick three slides about that. First of all, there's a lot of APIs being used out there. Uh, according to Akamai and their state of the internet uh, for the last year, what they're observing is 82% of all web traffic is now not HTML, but actually API traffic. So the web that we know it as the, we know it today is primarily API driven. And obviously this changes the, uh, the threat model. Um, Gartner had the uh, API strategy maturity model released just, just last month. And they are saying that because of that transition, they're expecting that uh, in the year after, after next, by 2021, so basically almost a year from now, uh, they are expecting that for 90% of web-enabled applications, uh, their, their APIs will be the larger attack surface than the, their user interface. And obviously, as a result of that, um, again, Gartner is expecting that by 2022, APIs are to become number one attack vector overall. And, and this is happening, right? If, you're, um, if you have been looking at the cybersecurity reports and news lately, you've seen probably a lot of um, API related attacks and, and breaches happening over the last um, few months. So uh, why, um, so that, that's the reason why API security is important. Now why um, OWASP, and you're probably all familiar with OWASP, OWASP top 10 for web security has been up there, out there for a long time, I believe since 2003. So why now um, are we releasing um, OWASP top 10 for API security specifically? And so the, the reason for that is that the, uh, we believe uh, that the um, attack scenarios and the threat model uh, uh, for API security is different uh, than the one that we had in the traditional web applications. So traditionally in the web applications, uh, this was the, the overall architecture, right? So you had your, your server, your application server, and obviously some database that it um, uh, was working with, and it would have some functionality and it would work with some data. And then 
when it needs, when a user wanted to see and use the, the application, basically your browser would send a GET request and then the backend server would do whatever processing is required and just send back HTML to be rendered by the client. Um, and uh, this is not the way that uh, applications are designed and architected today. So today we are in the world of, of mobile applications, of single page rich web applications, uh, of devices and, and so on and so forth. And in, in all of those scenarios, typically a lot of the um, processing and a lot of the logic is actually at the client. And so the client would typically work with the backend by sending some API requests, getting back some raw data and then doing the processing uh, here at the client side. And so this fundamentally changes uh, the security model because now this client has access to lots of raw data and is often maintaining the state, right? So REST is fundamentally stateless um, and uh, your backend is sort of relying on the client to tell it uh, what information is needed and so on. And so in that case, if attackers start using the APIs directly, they can get a lot more data or they can change a lot more data as well than uh, in the traditional model. And obviously this is uh, all aggravated by just the sheer amount of APIs like we were uh, mentioned in, in the previous few slides, right? Uh, with the uh, decomposition of um, applications into microservices architectures, uh, into uh, cloud-based architectures and into distributed model, um, obviously you're just getting a lot of calls that used to be internal calls in monolith applications between components and our API calls. So again, your attack surface uh, uh, grew tremendously. So that, that's why the top 10 is, is different, why we believe that the world needs another top 10 specifically for API security. Um, and so uh, in this uh, session, we'll go through those top 10. Again, uh, they are sort of um, ordered uh, in the, uh, by priority and by, by the potential uh, damage uh, that uh, you can get from those vulnerabilities and also uh, by how widespread they are. And as I mentioned, for all of them, I will uh, be given specific examples. And uh, most of the examples are from um, episq.io. Um, and uh, this is the website that you can use to sign up for a newsletter and just read the news and so on. So let, let's get started. So the first one is broken object level uh, authorization. And for those of you who have been in the um, cybersecurity for a long time, uh, this is also known as IDOR. Uh, insecure direct object reference. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it is fundamentally, kind of goes, I guess, fundamentally from uh, the way that REST APIs have been traditionally designed. So traditionally your REST APIs uh, is, are based on, on, on some sort of paths to the resources and are relying on the client maintaining the state and figuring out what it needs. And so your, your typical REST call would include some sort of identifiers uh, of resources sent either in the path or in some other parameter, like in a query parameter or some, or some other way. And so you would, for example, if I'm using a, a bank application and I need, I have logged in, so I'm, I'm authenticated, and now I want to get a list of my accounts, I make a call, I get a list of my accounts, now I want details for a specific account your typical call would look like something like that with the ID of the account. So now the attack in the attack scenario, um, the attacker figures out, gets authenticated, figures out the, the API, but then instead of um, an account ID that belongs to him or her, uh, they supply a different ID that doesn't belong to them, but the backend doesn't properly check the authentication, uh, authorization, excuse me, and sends back the data belonging to someone else. Make sense? So let me give you an example of uh, how that actually got uh, exploited in the past. So a very, probably one of the most famous breaches related to this scenario happened to T-Mobile. T-Mobile is a, is a big uh, mobile operator. Um, and obviously as, as any mobile operator, they have uh, their web applications, their portals, so their customers can um, log in and, and manage their account. And so what happened uh, was that uh, one of their websites uh, used the REST API under the hood and the REST API in the URL 
um, uh, took a parameter of the ID of the account, and that ID was actually a, a phone number uh, of the user. And in return, it, it uh, returned all the data about the user, right? So not just the name, but all the data about the account and, and so on and so forth. Everything that T-Mobile uh, knew about the user which is obviously very, very bad, right? Because now someone can, if I, if I want to take over an account um, by Christine, for example, and I know her phone number, I can make that call for the phone number of Christine, get all the information about her, uh, and then I can use that against her. For example, I can, I can call T-Mobile um, and try to change my voice to, to Christine's uh, and then um, say that I need a new SIM card. And when they will start asking me any questions about my mother's maiden name or any, any other secret questions, I uh, guess what? They will be using the same database that I now have access to using that, um, that API. And so I will obviously be able to answer them exactly the way that their help desk person expects, uh, expects them to be answered. Um, and uh, to make things worse, actually, um, since this was 2017, before the, I guess, before the world um, started awakening to the API security threats. Uh, they haven't noticed this immediately. And so uh, there are actually still um, YouTube videos. So this YouTube video uh, of someone showing um, how to get into that API and how to use it, uh, this was published on YouTube. It's still available on YouTube. It was published uh, in, um, August, early August 2017, and it wasn't until uh, October 2017 that T-Mobile actually noticed the, the breach um, and, uh, and the vulnerability and fixed it. So for two months, uh, the, it was, at least for two months, the vulnerability not only was in the wild, but actually people could use uh, an online tutorial, a YouTube tutorial to exploit it. That, that's how bad it, it, uh, it, it, it went. Anyway, so uh, the way to mitigate that is obviously to, to do authorization, right? There's a difference between authentication and authorization. Someone can get authenticated, can have some username and password to get into a system, but then uh, use someone else's IDs. So don't, don't rely on IDs uh, sent from the client. Uh, make sure that you actually make uh, authorization checks uh, within your system. Oops. Sorry, huh. sorry for that. Okay, uh, let's let's go to number two, uh, broken authentication, right? So we talked about authorization, but obviously authorization is something uh, that you check when someone wants to get access to a specific resource. Authentication is just checking for your username and password or some other way to verify that you are who you say you are. Uh, and uh, so this is a very broad, um, broad vulnerability there are a lot of ways that you can do authorization in a different way and people get confused um, and a lot of developers get confused on what the best practices are uh, is it auth is it open id connect uh, can i just do an api key how do i send an api key uh, which api keys are good which ones are bad um, is basic authentication okay and so on and so forth so that that's a combination of all of these um, so let me give you an example um, an example that sort of is a little exotic, uh, but I, I, I like it nevertheless. And also it's, it's one of the examples from the IoT space and devices space. And obviously this space is, is exploding, right? More and more uh, devices that we buy to be used by us every, in our everyday life um, are smart devices these days. And they have APIs because they, they are being managed uh, from the cloud service to which you talk from your mobile application so if the right API calls going from you, from your mobile app to the cloud and then from the cloud to your device. So believe it or not, there are smart hot tubs. Um, so I guess the scenario is that you are on your way home and it's a, it's a cold uh, end of November day. Uh, and so you want your hot tub to be, to be hot and ready by the time that you arrive and you can manage it from your, from your mobile app. And so one of those hot tubs, uh, Balboa, had an API vulnerability. And so the vulnerability was from the way that they were doing authentication. And so a lot of those devices that you buy these days, the smart devices, the first time you want to hook up, to hook up your application, your mobile app 
to uh, to the device uh, works uh, through some sort of an uh, Wi-Fi hotspot kind of thing. So that the device would come uh, with a uh, Wi-Fi hotspot that you would just it would just turn it on, and you would select it from your uh, mobile app, and that, that's how the initial um, handshake happens. And so they, they wanted to make it super easy. And so they made that Wi-Fi hotspot the ID, the, the username uh, for the uh, initial authentication to make it very easy, right? You just, uh, you turn on the, uh, the hot tub, you, you run your mobile app, uh, you just pick that Wi-Fi ID and, and that's it, that's the username. Obviously you need the password. Uh, they made it super easy. They just uh, hard coded the password. So now it's super easy and super convenient for the user, for the consumer, they just pick that Wi-Fi hotspot exposed by the hot tub, and then the app just connects with a hard-coded password. Obviously, attackers uh, figured out the password, uh, and then uh, they could connect to the API. But wait, it gets even worse, uh, because not only uh, you could do that if you, for example, knew that your neighbor had that specific hot tub and, and you, uh, you figured out the password, um, all, also, uh, all the IDs, all those Wi-Fi uh, hotspots, they came uh, with the same prefix, uh, BWGSPA. Uh, and so you could actually figure out if someone had that kind of hotspot just by the Wi-Fi ID and you know the password, right? And then you could connect to the APIs. But even worse, since this uh, is a Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, there are websites out there uh, that have uh, catalogs of all the Wi-Fi hotspots in the world, on all the public Wi-Fi hotspots in the world, um, including these. Um, and so you could just use that uh, kind of um, uh, service to get a list of all those hot tubs globally and then access all of them. And even worse, those catalogs have exact GPS locations of each such hot, uh, hotspot. And so basically when that uh, vulnerability happened, anyone could go to such website, get a list of all the hot tubs of that, uh, uh, of that vendor, uh, and then connect to all of them, or any of them, through the internet and start managing them. So you could know when uh, those hot tubs were in use, you could um, change uh, the temperature or whatever. So obviously a, a physical, physical threat uh, for any consumers. Mitigation. Uh, in general, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, figure out and, and read about the best practices, um, how to implement properly open AD Connect and, and, and other, other approaches. Uh, use standard tools, well-known tools and libraries. Uh, the more standard and best practice uh, your authentication is, the better. Let's go to number three. Uh, number three is also very specific uh, to the way uh, that REST is typically implemented and used. Like we mentioned, uh, that your typical scenario is that your smart client, uh, your application, uh, needs some data, sends the request to the backend, the backend extracts the data from the database and sends it back to you as, as a raw data that you render afterwards. Um, now that the problem comes uh, that um, and it's really a kind of a, a human problem is that typically these are two different teams implementing the front end and the back end. And so if I'm implementing the, the front end and, and Kristen is implementing the back end and I need to, to render some data, I don't know, we are doing it at like a library uh, application and I need some data about a book that, that I would render in my app. I would go to Kristen and say, hey, I need to render information about books. You have that information in the database. Can you send that to me? And she would say, yeah, sure. Um, and uh, just send me a book ID and I'll, I'll send you the data. And so probably in my app, I just need, I don't know, five different fields about the book, whatever the, the title, the, the name of the, of the writer and, and so on. Uh, and then um, she can send that to me. But then maybe next week I want to implement a new feature and I can also, I also want to, to send the, the year when the book was uh, uh, was published or something. And so I would need to go to Christy and ask for another piece of data and she would, need to, she would need to update the API. It's much easier for us to avoid that 
and for her to just send everything back to me, just just retrieve all the data that she has about a particular book and send it to me and rely on me to render what I need, right? So that 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 makes our lives easier, but that's obviously a security issue because in that case, if she sends everything, she might be sending something that no one should be able to see, some internal confidential data that the client should never ever see. And then obviously in my mobile app, I would probably never ever show that data, but attackers would not use the mobile app. They would just use the API directly and get more information that is needed. So let, let's, let's have a look at the uh, real life scenario of, of how that happened, uh, happened to Uber uh, earlier this year. Um, this was actually a combination of, of two, uh, two issues that they had. One was, uh, it turned out that uh, for one of the API calls um, at driver, um, so you, you have that API uh, to add the driver. Uh, and for that API, you need to supply uh, the user's um, email address or uh, phone number. And so you would make that call. And uh, probably as an attacker, you would not be actually author authorized to do that. And so that would fail. So that's okay. However, their fail, uh, their, their error message uh, for this particular call contained information that they probably used at some point internally for debug reasons or, or, or whatever. Uh, and that, that was not supposed to be sent to the client. And that the client would actually never show that, that that's an internal theme, the internal implementation detail. But the API would have the internal ID of that user record, um, which is bad. It, it's an excessive data that, that is not supposed to be available. However, it was there. But it's not the end of the world, okay. But then attacker, once they got this information, they started looking at all the APIs, seeing whether they can use that unique ID of the user in some other call. And lo and behold, they, they found another call, uh, again, consent screen details, that um, had that exact ID as a parameter. And so they made the call, and I'm, I'm guessing from the name, get consent screen details, that that's something that uh, Uber application would typically show for, for consent screen uh, when you agree to all terms and services of Uber. And now when you, when you would make this call with this ID, they would send you back some data uh, for the details. And the problem is that they sent you a lot more data than any consent screen in any Uber application would ever need. They basically sent everything for that user, including um, including not just financial details and everything about the user, but also the mobile application token for that user, uh, which is horrible because now you can actually use that to authenticate as the user. So that would be it now from that, you can jump to broken authentication and you can do whatever you want on user behalf. So that's how one, uh, that excessive data vulnerability led to a full uh, authentication vulnerability. Uh, mitigation, uh, again, don't do that. Uh, define strictly what information your backend needs to send to your front end. Treat your APIs as your user interface. Don't do filtering on the client. Uh, don't do uh, data filtering. Do it on the backend and send only the information that's required. And obviously as, a, uh, as an additional benefit of that, uh, you can review with your compliance people all the data that you are sending because you, all your schemas are defined and you can make sure that you're also GDPR compliant and, and so on and you don't send any sensitive or personal ident, uh, information and, and, and so on. Let's go to number four. Uh, so number four is your typical um, denial of service scenarios uh, or distributed denial of service scenarios. So that's uh, vulnerability when you don't have a proper rate limiting on you're not checking for the data sizes that get that gets uh, sent. And so as a result, attackers can just overwhelm your server. Uh, they can bring them down, they can make them non-responsive and so on. So one of the recent examples that we had just, just last month was an um, Kubernetes uh, API server uh, denial of service scenario. Uh, so uh, Kubernetes uh, kubectl uh, command or the API uh, in the API server allows you to change Kubernetes uh, configuration, make uh, other uh, Kubernetes calls. And so one, uh, one of the ways to do that is to send a, a config map to Kubernetes. And so this config map 
actually allowed you to use as part of YAML, and that's part of YAML specification. It allows you to define elements as other elements. So for example, in, in this scenario, uh, you could say, okay, there, there's an element called I, um, and it is defined as 10 elements called H. And so when the uh, Kubernetes API server got that, it started expanding that. So it started saying, okay, instead of I, I'll now use 10 H's. So what's, what's an element H? And then it looked up here and it looked, oh, H, H is actually 10 G's. So it would go and substitute each H with 10 G's and now we have 100 elements. And you, you, you can see where this is going, right? It, it just keeps expanding. And now we've got 100 Fs and 1000 Es and, and so on. Um, and that, that's how obviously attacker can, can put as many of them as, as attacker wanted. And at the end of the day, uh, the, the web server, the API server of Kubernetes just became super slow, just, just expanding with this config map. Right, so basically to avoid that, again, set rate limits so no one can invoke your APIs uh, too often. Uh, make sure that you limit the payload sizes. Make sure that you check on the compression ratios if you're accepting zips, uh, if you accept XML or, or YAML or other other config languages that allow expansions. Uh, make sure maybe you you just don't don't allow expansions anymore. That's the fix that Kubernetes uh, team um, has implemented, um, and and so on. So don't don't allow for such recursions. Uh, and then obviously in your backend, whatever you're using, Docker or um, what have you, make sure you set, pro set proper limits on the CPU and, um, and, and memory usage and so on. Number five. Uh, number five is very, very similar to the one uh, with which we started when, uh, when an attacker would use someone else's ID. In this particular case, this one is different. It is, uh, function level authorization. So it's also authorization specific, but in this case, uh, user changes something, some parameter or part of the path. And instead of uh, doing something that user is supposed to do, kind of user level um, API, they use that to jump to some sort of an admin or privileged API, privileged function that they are not supposed to use. Um, but they sort of, they just somehow guess the proper parameters of proper path. And once they get the information, they can make that call. And the backend just trusts that since the client makes that call, maybe the client knows better and maybe they're allowed to do that. So they, they, the backend doesn't check uh, authorization properly and just give them access because they trust and uh, because they trust them. So uh, a pretty scary example of that uh, was recently with one of the kids smartwatches brands. Um, I'm a parent myself, uh, and I, I can understand why uh, parents want to know where the kids are and, and want to make sure that they can contact their kids and at any time and, and, and so on and, and call the kids. And so smartwatches sound like a perfect, uh, perfect idea. Uh, you give your kid a smartwatch, um, you can use your mobile app then to know where, the, where your kid um, is. Uh, you can give them a call and then you can use that smartwatch and typically the smartwatches can be configured to only accept calls from you but not from anyone else and, and so on. So that sounds like a perfect idea. Um, and uh, unfortunately one of them, uh, actually quite a few of them were found to be very insecure coming from some um, unknown little brands uh, under very, very cheap prices and uh, from the brands and companies not caring about security. Uh, so this particular brand, uh, Gator, um, uh, actually, when researchers started, the researchers bought a uh, bought uh, a watch, and started making calls and 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 looking at uh, what kind of parameters get passed, and they noticed that whenever they would make a call, one of the parameters called uh, user grade was always set to one. Anything else would change. This one would always be sent to one. So they changed it to two, and it didn't work. They changed it to zero, and it turned out that when they changed it to zero, they became admins. So this, this single change made them admins um, uh, in the system. So not just the admins for a particular smartwatch, but the admins for the, for the cloud service overall. And now they could uh, be able to, to get a list of all the users in the system, and they were able uh, to 
see where all the kids uh, who were using those smart uh, watches were uh, even then uh, names if parents provided that and then gender and they were able to call any of them and so on so pretty pretty scary stuff and again the physical security coming from api security um, so again the advice is similar to the one that we gave in um, uh, for the first first vulnerability just don't uh, don't rely on the client knowing better make sure that you make your authorization checks uh, in your in your backend, deny all access by default. Make sure that only people with proper roles and proper groups get proper access, properly designed and tested. Cool, we are over half. Uh, number six, mass assignment. Again, something very specific to the to the ways that um, APIs and and applications are designed these ways. So it is and and similar in a way to the excessive uh, data exposure that we talked about. Um, in the past, um, but uh, sort of going the other way around. So suppose now I need to change some data, like maybe in my library app, I need to be able to change my, my address when I, when I move um, or whatever, or change the status of my books or something. And so in my, in my app, um, what the way that I would typically do that, I would make a post um, and I would send that a JSON with some sort of new properties, like my new uh, street address and, and, and city and, and um, postal code. And then the backend would uh, extract all the data from, from the JSON and write that to the database. Now the problem comes that typically those JSONs can have quite a few elements, right? Maybe my, my first name, last name, uh, street address, city, and, and, and postal code, and country, and so on. And so developer, they would need to go and check one by one, does this JSON have this property? If yes, take this property and write it to the database, and, and so on, and do that, whatever, 10 times. Instead of that, modern programming languages like, like, uh, like Node.js and, and Ruby and so on, they actually have a way to just take a JSON structure, and convert it into an object and write this object directly to the database. And the problem comes when the attacker knows about that and they sneak in some additional elements into that JSON. And now the backend implementation just uh, is using that, whatever that, that Ruby code that simply takes all the properties, turns them into an object and writes to the database. And if my database has some sensitive um, uh, properties of the object, um, it might just blindly get those uh, from that backend implementation uh, that it's not supposed to get. So let me give you a quick example. A vulnerability, that kind of vulnerability that happened to Harbor uh, a couple months ago. So Harbor is a, is a uh, relatively actually quite popular container registry system. So if you're using Kubernetes or, or VMware or something, uh, you would need a register of all the base images, right? So when someone wants to spin up a new container, a new virtual machine, there should be a base image. Um, and so uh, obviously users have accounts so they can get authentication to, to the system and to, to get the base images. And optionally, uh, when you're running such a system, uh, you can let users uh, self sign up. Again, it's a perfectly legitimate thing. Users fill out a form like this one and, and they can um, sign up uh, and get an account. It would be a regular user account and they would be able to start using the system. And so uh, under the hood, there's an API call, a post call, like, um, like I've mentioned, and, and it just passes the, that information. Now, the, the problem is that uh, 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 this is actually an open source project. Uh, so um, uh, researchers uh, looked at that, um, at the code, and they found a, a structure for user record, and they found that yes, that there's username and, and, and so on. But um, among other elements, there's one element called uh, has admin role, and they found that uh, right in the code, they found that it, it, match, it maps to has underscore admin underscore role uh, JSON. Uh, tag. Uh, and so after that, once they knew that, the only thing they, they had to change was instead of this call, regular call, uh, they simply added this one line, has underscore uh, admin underscore role uh, equals true. Uh, they even knew the type. 
And it turned out that the backend implementation simply blindly uh, brought that to a database. And now anyone using that API call could register not as a regular user, but as an admin. And if you're an admin of a container registry, you can do a lot of damage. You can substitute all the base images in the company with your base images. Um, and now you can, you can do some Bitcoin mining or you can, you can do some ransomware or whatever. You, you have the keys from, from the data center, basically. Uh, again, mitigation, just don't, don't do that. Don't automatically bind all data to internal objects. Explicitly define sp that specific schemas, specific properties that you need and then use just them and reject anything else. Number seven. Uh, number seven is a broad one again. Uh, it's security misconfiguration. Um, so these are your typical scenario of your implementation not enforcing HTTPS, for example, not enforcing encrypted uh, communications and accepting non-encrypted, or not, not properly implemented cores, or not uh, properly um, enforcing security HTTP headers, um, maybe um, allowing uh, traversal of your um, uh, folders and, and files on the server using images that are not hardened, uh, doing verbose errors um, like we've seen in the scenario of Uber, um, or maybe if your application crashes, sending back uh, exception traces and so on. So all of those things uh, can lead to a vulnerability. Uh, the most well-known scenario uh, probably uh, and, and breach is Equifax. So Equifax started uh, from a breach uh, from a call uh, with a content type HTTP header um, and uh, the problem was that the Apache Struts library used by Equifax uh, had the vulnerability and Equifax didn't have a proper uh, patch process in place. And so this was a known vulnerability at that point, um, but they didn't, uh, they didn't patch it quickly. And so hackers figured out uh, that Apache Struts was used. Uh, they sent an injection uh, in that header and that injection, um, uh, was uh, then processed by Apache Struts and, and got executed. And that's how the um, attackers got in initially and obviously then expanded after that. Uh, mitigation, obviously, all your um, regular processes of hardening your servers and, and uh, monitoring them and, and patching that and updating them and making sure that your administrative rights are restricted and, and so on and so forth. Uh, number eight. Number eight is again, we, we've just talked about the injection that happened at Equifax. Uh, number eight is uh, about injections. Uh, and again, SQL injections are very well known, but they, they don't have to be SQL injections. There are no SQL injections out there. There are LDAP injections. Uh, there are injections related to uh, PowerShell or, or some other um, system command scenario and, and so on. So basically, um, in a nutshell, in this scenario, your attackers send you an API call and the API call, instead of simply having some expected value, some, some sort of property, it also has some code and uh, maybe separated from, from the initial property. And then your backend at some point has some sort of an interpreter, like a SQL uh, database query or, or command line and so on. And, and your backend just blindly it takes that input and appends it to, uh, to, to that call to that to the local interpreter. And then the interpreter um, executes your expected command, but also executed whatever is, is sent in the parameter. And then the breach happens. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of those happen. It, it's a fairly known and, and widespread um, issue. Uh, and so Samsung uh, Smart Things Hub is, is one relatively recent example that that's from 2018. And so um, that's an IoT uh, hub for your home, for your smart home. And obviously you can register devices there when you have a, um, when you have a, a, a hub like that. Uh, so for example, uh, you can add a camera at home and you want to add this camera to your smart, uh, to your smart things hub. To do that, you can make an API call uh, and uh, you would register that camera 
and you would provide your username and password credentials for that camera. And then data is sent, uh, saved in a, in a database. Uh, and so this API call uh, accepts JSON. And the problem is that this JSON uh, allowed uh, to supply any parameter as the, as the username and passwords, and it wouldn't do proper um, synthesization and, and proper checks for the characters. And so attacker could uh, just uh, create, create a JSON and in that JSON, um, just add a um, semicolon and add any, um, and then any, uh, any, any token in there, any code. And then obviously attacker probably doesn't have credentials for your cameras at home. However, uh, they, they can supply anything, right? Because this thing doesn't verify. And then they would register camera and they, they would call delete to delete this camera. And so the problem is that when this delete happens, it would append to the SQL query your credentials. And those credentials would have your SQL command. And this is the point when your SQL command can get executed. So basically attackers now can get access uh, to whatever, to full access to the database. And they can figure out what are the devices you have, what are the credentials for those devices, or they can start deleting devices or managing them and, and so on. Uh, mitigation. Mitigation is fairly well known. It's, it's a well known um, issue. Uh, injections have been around for some time. So just again, don't, don't trust your API consumers. Uh, define strictly what you are expecting and only accept what you're expecting. Uh, enforce all the characters, uh, enforce all the patterns, enforce all the limits, sanitize and, and, and filter everything. And also do that not just on the incoming calls, but also on your responses, right? So you can prevent um, your, your, your data leaks. Uh, number nine, we have two left. Uh, number nine is improper asset management. Uh, and so uh, suppose you've created a very, very good production for your production system. It has all the proper authentication authorization and everything. The images have been properly hardened. Everything is perfect. Attackers cannot get through. Now, chances are that you are very agile and that your teams have many APIs. For example, they have some, some dev environments, some test environments, some staging environments, and, and they also iterate quickly. So they, they might have whatever, your v3.3.5 is, is the current version of the API, uh, but they, they have some old versions as well, because maybe the previous version of um, your mobile app needs the previous version of your API, and you don't want to cut off uh, uh, your users of your previous versions of the mobile apps. So you end up having multiple environments, not just your production, multiple versions, multiple Kubernetes containers running multiple versions of your API. Some might be in your stage and not testing, some might be your legacy versions. And chances are that a lot of them have access to that same production database, right? For example, your legacy versions would probably have that. Uh, and maybe your station environment has that, uh, oops, uh, and so on. And so if any of these don't have security set on par with your production system, attackers might just avoid attacking your production system and attack some of them and, and get access just fine. This is exactly what happened to Just Dial uh, this year. Uh, those of you from India uh, know uh, what it is. It's a very popular uh, local um, search um, service in India. It has uh, more than 100 million users. Um, so it is, it's huge. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, this system had an API and that API got changed at some point. So they had an old unused and unprotected, completely unprotected API. So if you knew the URL of the old API and this API was no longer in use by them, so their, their current website and their mobile app was not using that API. But the API was sort of some early version of the API that they did when they were just working on the on V1 of the product. And they left it out there, left up and running, and it was accessed in the same live database. So anyone could just use that old API as long as they knew the URL and get, get access and uh, be able to get any, any data on uh, 100 million plus uh, users. Uh, again, uh, no silver bullet, but you need, you need to know all the API hosts. You need to do proper discovery. You need to make sure that anything that accesses your live 
uh, production database is as secure as your current production version. So if there's a production, uh, if there's a security change that you implement in the current API, make sure you implement them, uh, those changes in all the uh, early APIs. And then if um, your stage environment or your test environment needs access to production data, then it needs to be treated as, as production API, or you, you should be able to see if you can avoid that um, altogether. And finally, we got to number 10. Uh, number 10, event logs, uh, events, uh, logging and monitoring. So um, machine learning and blockchain are great, but <laughs> your events are even more important than that. If bad things happen, you need to know that bad that, that, that things are happening. Um, and you need to be able, from your logs, uh, from your monitoring system, you need to be able, uh, notified that something, something bad is, is happening. And from your logs, you need to be able to figure out what, what exactly happened. Um, one uh, scenario uh, of uh, how things could get wrong happened in, in Japan earlier this year. 7-Eleven uh, is extremely popular in Japan, and um, set of um, groceries, uh, well, uh, set of stores um, uh, across the country. Um, and so uh, at some point they decided to add a payment, a payment application um, to, to their service, for their customers. And so this payment application, um, uh, users could consumers could use it to, to pay for the for the goods um, and uh, it had the ability to have username and password and it obviously had a way to reset your password uh, for some reason uh, they have designed it in a way that you could not just change your password but you could also say that your email address changed and supply a new email address and for that you had to supply some some personal detail uh, to sort of prove that you are who you were uh, saying that you were um, and, and so for that, they, they would ask, if I remember right, they, they would ask for like your name and uh, your date of birth and uh, maybe your address, phone number or something. Uh, and so the, the way API calls to do that because the, the, the mobile app was using API calls. Uh, and so what attackers did was they just went directly across against those API calls. Uh, they found database um, of um, information about various Japanese citizens, including those personal details, and then they would just script and start doing API calls one by one. And then when they were lucky, uh, they could get in and, uh, and take over an account by supplying their own email address. Uh, and so this, uh, unfortunately, there was no proper monitoring and, uh, and, and, and logging in place. And so when this started happening, 7-Eleven in Japan, they, they didn't notice that. Obviously, people started complaining to their regular help desk, but they, the help desk people had no idea about that vulnerability. And so this was, I think it took three days before the company figured out that the API was breached. And by that time, more than half a million um, dollars uh, was stolen from uh, more than 900 uh, customers. Uh, again, mitigation, uh, log all failed attempts, all, all denied access, make sure that you're, you're using proper systems to, to work with the logs, you have proper monitoring in place, proper thresholds, and, and you get notified when bad things happen. So these are the top 10. Uh, you, I would encourage you uh, to, to join the project. The project, uh, uh, you can find, so I, I understand that obviously the links uh, in the webinar are not, not clickable. Uh, but you can find them even on apisq.io. Uh, we have a um, section uh, for OS uh, top 10, and it, it has information. It has uh, the links. It has links to the uh, HubSpot project, uh, to the GitHub project. It has uh, links to the to the hot, uh, to the homepage of the project and, and uh, mailing list and, and so on. Or you can just obviously Google for it as well. Uh, with that being said, uh, I think we have about 10 minutes uh, for, for Q&A, um, so I'm uh, happy to, to answer any questions. I think we have quite All a few. right, we have a bunch of questions, so I'll go in order as they were received. And what we don't get to, we will put in a blog and make sure that you guys get the link to that, so you'll have all the questions and answers in one place. Uh, the first one for you, Dimitri, is just as with OWASP Top 10, it seems the API top 10 is not an exhaustive list. If I, 
if I was a developer, I, if I as a developer use this as a checklist, I could find myself vulnerable. Is there an initiative to educate API developers on fundamental principles behind the top 10? Uh, so excellent question. Uh, yes, um, I, I agree. So uh, the, the top 10 sort of brings attention uh, to, the, uh, to the most frequent vulnerabilities, but it's not, it's not a specific checklist that you can go through and say, yes, yes, I'm, 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 I fix that, fix that, fix that. Uh, we do plan to work on checklists within OWASP uh, API top 10. And then there are other resources as well. Um, so the, um, I think the API vulnerability at epsecurity.io is, is something that you can use to get started. Uh, that there are some, some checklists are there. So there are a few, uh, a few initiatives like that. Some will come from OWASP, uh, some will come from um, other initiatives. Uh, there's nothing that I can recommend right now as a sort of single, um, a single resource that would, would solve everything. Um, you, you have to get um, educated and you have to, to look what's, what's out there. And then obviously there are, there are tools as well that can help you doing different uh, security audits and so on. All right, next question. What is the best source to know what is the state of art authentication protocol and how to keep up with the new ones? Uh, for authentication uh, specifically, um, uh, get yourself educated about OAuth and, and OpenID Connect uh, and, and the current recommendations there. Um, IETF um, actually has uh, released best practices uh, for, for OAuth. Uh, read the document. Um, yeah, get yourself educated uh, about how, how to do that by reading kind of well-regarded uh, books and, and the recommendations from the standard bodies. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. All right, thanks for that one. Next one, does GraphQL make an API more or less vulnerable to excessive data exposure, or does it just change the way that the developer has to protect the API? Uh, so, um, excellent question. So GraphQL, um, I would say GraphQL is one of those technologies that can potentially uh, make it, again, make it easier to build vulnerable APIs uh, just because again, GraphQL lets you sort of do SQL-like queries from the client. And so, again, if your backend just blindly trusts uh, those queries and, and sends back whatever is requested, then yes, you are vulnerable to, to excessive data exposure. So again, um, just like we mentioned for REST, same, same thing for GraphQL, uh, make sure that you control uh, what you accept, uh, that you, um, you give people only what they're supposed uh, to be receiving. Treat your API as your, as your user interface. Okay, we have one that has been asked multiple times. So I'm gonna skip down to this one. Um, is there an automated tool which can scan our APIs and find out any possible vulnerabilities? Uh, yes, <laughs> there are tools out there. Uh, so the, uh, the company actually, so the company for which Christian and I work for the crunch um, has uh, some of the tools like that. Uh, I think we have a webinar that would, uh, on December 12th, that would uh, be kind of more product specific. Um, so you are obviously welcome to join that. Um, and uh, also, so for to crunch has tools for both static analysis of APIs and also for um, live um, testing and, and scanning of, of API points. Um, so ch check this out, and um, so there are probably other other tools on the market as well, of which I'm less aware. So I welcome you to, to check them out and to join the other webinar. Uh, somebody else asked, which OWASP uh, version are you referring to? Mm. Okay, so yeah, so OWASP uh, API Security Top 10 uh, is, uh, this year we are releasing the first one. It is in release candidates right now. And that's what I uh, was using for those slides. There's going to be a, a final released version uh, by the end of the year. And then obviously in subsequent years, um, uh, we will be updating the list um, as the threads change and as, uh, as the world changes. 
So I was referring specifically to release candidate version of OSP API Security Top 10 2019. All right, we have time for a couple more. Um, let me see here. How can I contribute to the OWASP API security project? Oh, yes, so please do. Uh, so uh, there's a GitHub project uh, and there's a, a distribution uh, list, mailing list. Um, so again, as, as I mentioned, you can just Google for them or you can go and, and find them from apsq.io encyclopedia in the in the links so yes please please contribute and take part in the discussion it is a community effort like i mentioned okay we have a bunch more we're not going to be able to get into um i'm going to address a couple uh i've seen a few come in that uh, you guys are asking how are you going to get the webinar recording and are the slides going to be available the answer is yes so we'll have a follow-up email that'll go out to everybody that registered for the webinar. It'll have a link to the recording, to the OWASP cheat sheet, the slides, um, and a few other things. Uh, we do have a, another webinar on December 12th that'll go into detail on uh, how our product solves some of these, um, some of the top 10, and a link to register for that will be in there as well. Dimitri, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's been, obviously, I want once again, thank to, to everyone uh, who has been involved in the project. Like I mentioned, there's more than one than a dozen contributors and uh, Ares and Inon and, and Paolo are doing a fantastic job um, leading and, and coordinating the project. Uh, so huge thanks to the whole, uh, to all of the community. And thank you all for, for coming in and, and joining the webinar. Let's make our APIs and, and our world in general a more cyber secure space. Thank you guys so much. And we hope to see you on the next webinar, December 12th. Thank you, Christine.